Two of the most central figures in the story of the Nauvoo Expositor were brothers William and Wilson Law. William Law was called to replace Hiram Smith as the second counselor in the first presidency. But over the next few years, the relationship between the Law brothers and Joseph Smith had some strains going. But the big issue for them was plural marriage. William just couldn't accept that revelation. He begged Joseph to give up plural marriage. And it reached the point where um, on January 8th, Joseph Smith dropped William Law from the first presidency. This is the big lie told by the Utah Mormon Church that William Law opposed Joseph Smith on the point of plural marriage. What a falsehood. William Law was excommunicated and exiled not only for swindling people out of land deals, but also for seducing a 16-year-old orphan girl on the floor in the home of her adopted family. This was scandalous. William Law also confessed to adultery and begged Joseph Smith for forgiveness. Finally, William Law led up a band of Missourians to threaten Joseph Smith's life late at night at the mansion house. And the Utah Mormon Church still has the audacity to continue its big lie that somehow William Law was excommunicated because he opposed Joseph Smith on plural marriage. Quite the contrary. William Law was engaged in wife swapping and seducing 16 year old orphan girls besides counterfeiting swindling people out of land deals and threatening joseph smith's life even paying joseph jackson or offering to pay joseph jackson a reprobate who lived in nauvoo five hundred dollars to murder joseph smith putting out what you call a mafia style contract on Joseph Smith's life. If you don't believe me, listen to the rest of the story. It's all contained in the Nauvoo City Council meeting, meeting minutes of June 8th and June 10th, 1844, for everyone to read. And yet, for 200 years, the Utah Mormon Church has convinced all its scholars who fail to read and all its members that somehow William Law was the good guy in this duo. Quite the contrary. William Law was a scoundrel, a thief, and a con man, and seduced young 16-year-old girls on the floors of her, promising her that he would take care of her financially, in other words, becoming his plural wife, and then abandoning her, leaving her heartbroken. She turned to the Relief Society, and they stepped in and demanded that Joseph Smith publicly shame William Law and tell the rest of Nauvoo to beware of him. These revelations about William Law are not new. They are in black and white contained in the Nauvoo City Council meeting minutes of 1844 of June. They are appear in black and white on the website Joseph Smith Papers. And yet, it appears the Utah Mormon Church and all of its scholars have been in a mass trance for over 200 years, failing even to observe or understand what the city council minutes mean. The council meetings deal maybe two lines about plural marriage. It was a side point. What they were concerned about was the insurrection that was being planned and the targeted murder of the Smith family. This is what the main concern of the city council at Nauvoo was about. And they held a trial and they had plenty of witness statements showing that the Smiths were being targeted for assassination, that the laws, the Higbees, the Fossers, were engaged in counterfeiting money, and the expositor was calling for the revocation of the 
Nauvoo Charter, which would result in mass insurrection and the overrunning of the city and the probable killing of Joseph Smith and the Hiram Smith family, which in 10 days time, the assassination of Hiram and Joseph took place. I'm revisiting the city council meeting of June 8th and 10th, in which the following was discussed. Joseph Jackson came to the city and plotted to kidnap Levina Smith and kill the entire Smith family. Joseph Jackson disclosed to many of the Nauvoo res residents that he was involved in criminal activity with Wilson and William Law in counterfeiting money on the New York and Missouri banks. And the expositor printing press was being used to counterfeit this money. Joseph M Smith revealed to the city council that he had been told that William Law offered Joseph Jackson $500 to murder Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith again stated he was against polygamy in that his celestial marriage revelation had been misconstrued. What it meant was that people were married in the celestial kingdom and continue to be married, not that they should have two spouses while living on earth. Dr. Foster, who had been excommunicated and exiled from the city, came to the city and confronted Joseph Smith and pulled out a pistol. Joseph Smith exclaimed that he believed Dr. Foster was going to kill him. William Law led up the Mississippi at night. A boat full of 12 Missourians went to Joseph Smith's house close to midnight and confronted him. They were drunk and they demanded that Smith come out and face them. Smith came out and told them that they must leave and how dare they come at this night. If Smith had not been guarded by his bodyguards that night, he probably would have been killed. William Law was embarrassed and contrite and wrote the city council his apology for such behavior, which the city council noted that in this apology, William Law confessed to all his deeds of assaulting and accusing and threatening death to Joseph Smith. Finally, the Expositor newspaper that was a business concern of the Laws, the Higsby's, the Foster's, and William Emmons wrote a scurrilous article about Joseph Smith's polygamy, but not only that, called for an insurrection called for the revocation of the Nauvoo Charter, which meant certain death for Joseph Smith and many of the Nauvoo citizens. This they considered to be traitorous and an act of insurrection. Based on all this, it is my conclusion that the Smiths were well supported by legal precedent to destroy a printing press especially in light of testimony that the expositor printing press was being used to counterfeit money. This is from Lucy Max Smith's autobiography. In the winter of 1843 and 1844, Joseph in organizing the police remarked that were it not for the enemies within the city, there would be no danger from without adding if it were not for a brutus i might live as long as caesar would have lived someone who suspected that joseph was alluding to william law went to the latter and informed him law became very upset and ordered a city council meeting at which law was mollified or he was uh, pacified by joseph smith that joseph meant no harm to him about that time a man by the name of Joseph Jackson, who, had seen, who was seen in the city several months, being desirous to marry Levinus Smith, Hiram's oldest daughter, asked her father if he would be willing to receive him as a son-in-law. Being answered in the negative, 
that Joseph Jackson requested it of Joseph to use his influence in his favor. As Joseph refused to do that, he next applied to the laws, who was our secret enemy, for assistance, stealing Levina from her father, and from this time forth he continued seeking out our enemies, till he succeeded in getting a number of them to join him in a conspiracy to murder the whole entire Smith family. They commenced holding secret secret meetings, one of which was attended by a man named Eaton, who was our friend, and he exposed the plot. Now, this secret meeting, I believe, was the Council of 50 that met in the Grove. So anyway, so Eaton, who was a young lad, had a, was invited and attended the secret meeting. And there is some documentation of this, uh, independent of Lucy's account of it. But Eaton went and exposed the entire plot to kill the entire Smith family to the Smiths. Okay. This man declared that the Higsbys, the Laws, the Fosters, were all connected with Jackson in his operations. There were also another individual named Augustine Spencer, a dissolute, I believe, was, concer was also concerned in this conspiracy. About the time Eaton disclosures, this man went to the house of his brother Orson and abused my sons and the church in such at such a rate that Orson finally told him that he must either stop or leave the house. Augustine refused, and they grappled. In the contest, in the contest, Orson was considerably injured. He went immediately to Joseph, stating that the his case and asking for a warrant. Joseph advised him to go to Doctor Foster, who is a justice of the peace. According, he went there, but was refused. Anyway, it goes on and that there was finally a trial um, held to deal with this fisticuffs and beating of Augustine Spencer, Augustine Spencer beating of his brother Orson Spencer. Anyway, Jackson and, these, and the apostates continue to gather strength till finally they establish a printing press in the midst, in our midst. Through this organ, they belched forth the most intolerable and blackest lies that ever palmed upon a community. Being advised that by men of influence and standing to have this scandalous press removed, the city council took the matter under consideration and finding that the laws had allowed them to do so, they declared it was a nuisance and had it treated accordingly. Now, this is an interesting story by Lucy Mac Smith. Have you ever heard that these co-conspirators, the Laws, the Hicksby, the Fosters, and more, more than likely, John C. Bennett, conspired to murder the entire, and here it says, to murder the whole Smith family. I've never heard that. Have you heard that? Well, this is corroborated by a city council meeting that was held in Nauvoo during, was held in June 8th and June 10th in Nauvoo. That was approximately only 10 days before the Smiths were assassinated. So they swore in their first witness Theodore Turley, a mechanic, who, after being sworn, testified that William Law and Wilson Law had brought in bogus dyes to him to fix. In other words, those were dyes to make counterfeit money. And that that and the implication is that William and Wilson Law were using the expositor's printing press to counterfeit money. Counselor Hiram Smith inquired what the good Foster and his brother and the Higbees and the Laws had ever done for this city. While his brother Joseph was under arrest from the Missouri pr prosecutors, the Laws and Robert Foster would have been ridden on a rail if he had not stepped in 
to ward off the event, an account of their oppressing the poor. So he's saying here that the laws of the Robert Fosters, these are the, uh, these were the more wealthy of the citizens, and that when Joseph Smith was in jail under the Missouri warrant, the rest of the community would have run out of the laws of the Fosters and the Higbees on a rail because of the the oppression these businessmen oppressed the city poor. So they would loan these the poor money and then they would extract high interest rates. And this was quite notorious during this period of time. Also, uh, some of the Mormons were known to have sold land to unsuspecting immigrants. When the immigrants arrived in the city, the land would have been sold out from underneath them. Several times, Joseph Smith would have had to come in and rescue some of these immigrants who were swindled. The mayor said while he was under arrest by writ of Governor Carlin, William Law sued him for $40. He was owing the laws, and it took the last expense money he had to pay it. Councilor Hiram Smith referred to J.H. Jackson coming to the city, and Mayor said that William Law had offered the Jacksons $500 to kill him. Now understand what he's saying? That Joseph Jackson had come to the city, and the mayor said, which is Joseph Smith said, that William Law had offered Joseph Jackson $500 in a murder contract to murder Joseph Smith. This is what Joseph Smith had heard. Counselor Hyam Smith continued. Jackson told him that he meant to have his daughter and threatened him if he made any resistance to Jackson related to him. Okay, Counselor Hyam Smith continued that Jackson told him that Jackson meant to have Levina, his daughter, and threaten Hiram if he made any resistance. Jackson related to him a dream that Joseph and Hiram were opposed to him and that he would execute his purposes, that Jackson had laid a plan with four or five persons to kidnap Hiram's daughter and threaten to shoot anyone who would come near after he had got her into the skiff, that Jackson was engaged in trying to make bogus money so Jackson was involved with the laws and making counterfeit money, which was his principal business, according to Hiram. He referred to the revelation read at the High Council of the Church, which had caused so much talk about the multiplicity of wives that said the revelation was in answer to the question concerning things that transpire in former days that when sick, William Law confessed to him that he had been guilty of adultery and was not fit to live and had sinned against his own soul and had inquired who was the Judge Emmons. When he came here, he had scarce two shirts. Now they're talking about Judge Emmons. Now they're talking, now here's Judge Emmons. When he came to Nauvoo, he barely had two shirts on his back, but he had been handled by the authorities of the city of where he had come from. And now he had risen to being part of head editor of the Nauvoo Expo Expositor. And he was the right-hand man to Francis Higby, who had confessed to him that he had the blank. Now that is hilarious. They so left a blank there. What is blanked out is that Francis Higby had caught a venereal disease from a traveling prostitute and that William Law had disclosed this to Joseph Smith who warned the Relief Society and the men in Nauvoo. This embarrassed Francis Higby to the point where he sued Joseph Smith for slander. Well, as I believe John Taylor recites or Willard Richard recites in his diary, 
that Francis Higby and Joseph Smith met on the street of Nauvoo, and they ironed out their differences, and they left each other friends, until the Higbys again, once again, turned against Joseph Smith in the end. Now, the Higbys were aides de comp to the laws, William and Wilson Law. So, all of these fellows, including the Fosters, worked together to destroy Joseph Smith, and basically to extract the wealth of Nauvoo. Washington Peck, a witness, was sworn and said, Soon after Joseph H. Jackson came to the city, he came to witness to the witness, that's Washington Peck, he came to Washington Peck to borrow money, which the witness loaned him, and he took some jewelry as security. Soon after, a man from across the river came to Washington Peck and asked after the jewelry. He told Washington Peck that Jackson, Joseph Jackson, had stolen the jewelry from him. This is the jewelry that Joseph Jackson used as security for the loan from Washington Peck. So the witness told, Joseph Jackson told Washington Peck, that he was a damn fool, that he could make an easier living by going into business with him by making counterfeit money. And some men high in the church are engaged in doing this counterfeit business. Washington Peck asked if it was Joseph. No, said Jackson, Joseph Jackson, I dare not tell. I dare not tell it to Joseph Smith. Washington Peck understood that it was the laws who were engaged in the counterfeiting bogus money. Jackson said he would be the death of the witness if the witness, that's Washington Peck, ever went to Joseph or told anyone about their counterfeiting. Afterward, afternoon, so then they adjourn and they come back in the afternoon and it was ordered by the council that Sylvester Emmons be suspended until the case could be investigated for slandering the city council, that the recorder notify him of his suspension of, and that his case would come up for investigation at the next regular session of the council. Councilor John Taylor then said that Councilor Emmons helped to make the ordinances of the city and had never lifted his voice against them in the council and was now trying to destroy the ordinances and the charter that he had helped write. Lorenzo Wasson, Lorenzo Wasson was also now sworn as a witness. Lorenzo said that Joseph H. Jackson had told him that the bogus or counterfeit fitting was going on in the city, but it was too damn small of business that he wanted to help him procure money for General Smith, that he wanted to help him procure some more money for the General Smith was afraid to go into the counterfeiting business with him, and he needed $500 for an engraving for bills on the Bank of Missouri and one for the state of New York that could make money, and said many times the witness did not know, and he said to him many times the witness did not know him believed that the general had been telling the witness something. God damn him, if he was, I will kill him. Swore he would kill anyone who should prove a traitor to him, and that's Jackson. And Jackson said if he could get a company of men to suit him, he would go into the frontiers and live by the highway robbery. He had gotten so sick of the world. Now, I did not realize there was so much counterfeiting going on in Nauvoo, Nauvoo and it was the laws and the expositor that they were pointing the finger at, at committing this counterfeiting. And if true, legally, the Nauvoo City Council would be within their power to destroy that printing press, for it was engaging in illegal purposes. So anyway, the mayor suggested the council pass, pass an ordinance to prevent misrepresentations and libelous publications and conspiracies against the peace of the city. And referring to the reports that Dr. Foster, Foster had set afloat, 
said that he had never made any proposals to Foster to come back to the church. Foster proposed to come back to the church and came to the mayor's house and wanted a private, private interview with the mayor, Smith. They had a conversation with Foster in the hall in the presence of several gentlemen on the 7th. And then they offered to meet him with an interview in the presence of other friends, three or four to be selected by each party, which Foster agreed with that to solve their differences, this is the differences between Foster and Joseph Smith, that they would each choose three witnesses to come and and sit in judgment. And Joseph Smith said he was going to pick Hiram and that Foster could pick three of his good friends and they come back to the city and then they would have this mini trial to determine whether Foster could come back to the church or if Foster had done wrong. Now, supposedly Foster was upset because he had been excommunicated and being excommunicated, nobody would do business with him. And so he had left the city, but he still had property there. So he was demanding that the Mormon church buy his property, his real estate, because he could no longer do business as far as he was concerned because he was an excommunicated Mormon and Mormons would shun him. But now he was begging, Foster was begging to get back into the good graces of the church so he could come back to Nauvoo and conduct business. This was the animosity between Joseph Smith and Foster, that Foster was bitter, deeply bitter against Joseph Smith. And in fact, pulled a gun on Joseph Smith, almost ready to shoot him before Joseph Smith calmed him down at this confrontation that Foster had in Nauvoo during the day. And this was to General Joseph Smith, June 7th, 1844. Sir, I've consulted my friends in relation to your proposals of settlement, and they, as well as myself, are of the opinion that your conduct and that your new, unworthy, unprincipled clam, if so base, would be morally wrong and detract from the dignity of the gentleman to hold any conference with you. The repeated insults and abuses I, I, as well as my friends, have suffered from your unlawful course towards us demand honorable presentment that we resolve to make this our motto. Nothing on our part has been done to provoke your anger, but you have done all things as become that are not becoming of men. You have trampled upon everything we hold dear and sacred. You have set all law at defiance and profaned the name of the Most High to carry out your damnable purposes. And I have nothing more to fear from you than you have already threatened. And I am well, and I am as well as my friend who stay here and maintain and magnify the law as long as we stay and we are resolved never to leave until we sell or exchange our property that we have here. See, this is a letter written by the Fosters, and he's including several of his other friends that probably uh, were excommunicated by the Smiths. The proposals made by your agent, Dimick Huntington, as well as the threats you sent to intimidate me, I disdain and despise, as I do, their unhallowed author. The right of my family and a friend demands at my hands a refusal of your offers. We are united in virtue and truth, and we set hell at defiance, and all agents adieu. That's R.D. Foster. See the highfalutin language he's using? But this was in response to Joseph Smith offering that they have a meeting in which they both present their cases in front of six men, three chosen by Foster, three chosen by Smith, to determine whether or not he should return to the church or whether or not their property should be bought by the church so that they are compensated before they leave the community. But Foster is crying. He comes into town and cries and 
makes all sorts of threats because he's demanding to be welcomed back into the church. It's almost like these people are very borderline mentally ill, especially the Fosters. Very histrionic. Very, you can read from this letter how he calls himself, he's virtuous and the Smiths are devious and he and his friends are are so um, wanting only what is good and that the Smiths are unhallowed, okay, and that they despise and disdain the Smiths and that they be, feel that the Smiths only send people to intimidate the Fosters. The mayor continued that when Foster left his house, he went to a shoe shop in the hill and reported that Joseph Smith, that Joseph <coughs> and reported that Joseph said to him, if he would come back, he would give him the law's place <laughs> in the church and a hat full of species. Okay, what he's saying is that he's making the story up, obviously. Foster said that the mayor promised, Mayor Smith promised him, and this is a promise Foster is accusing Joseph Smith of breaking, promised him that he would be given, welcome back in the church, be given the um, status in the church of William Law, who I believe was the first counselor, and a hat full of money. Okay, next, Lucian Wadsworth was sworn.